My name's Bob Stewart. I just want to draw attention to my email address here as well. If you've got any questions or comments or anything like that that you would like to, to share with me, please drop me an email. I'm really happy to reply and help wherever possible. Uh, as, as I was introduced, um, I am looking, at, with my PhD research, I'm looking at how nutrients interact with the body. So looking at how nutrition, physiology and biochemistry all sort of come together and how yeah, nutrients can be absorbed and how this interacts with our gastrointestinal tract and with the body. Um, I come, well, before I came to university, I was actually a chef. So I've got an interest in food, but also I found that, that knowing how things work is really important as well. So I kind of want to share how things work and how this implicates on health. The picture here is a picture of a oozing chamber. Um, it's one of the tools that I've used in the past to screen treatments that enhance iron absorption or potentially enhance iron absorption. I've put it up today because it looks impressive. Um, it's, it's got glassware, colours and bubbles and it's actually quite a cool little system. So that's that. I'm going to break this presentation down into four different parts. Points one and two I'm going to be quite brief on. Um, but I think it's important that we know what iron does in the body. Um, and it's also important to know when you have an iron, or a deficiency in iron, what actually happens, why iron deficiency is actually bad. But I want to spend the majority of today looking at the mechanism of iron absorption, looking at what actually happens within the gastrointestinal tract and why this makes iron so difficult to absorb. And then I want to talk finally about dietary approaches that we can use to improve iron uptake, ways that we can actually improve iron bioavailability. Right, so the role of iron within the body, or a few of the roles anyway. I'm sure this is reasonably clear to most of you, but iron is involved in distributing oxygen around the body. So iron is bound within a porphyrin ring, this makes heme iron. Heme iron is bound within hemoglobin, it binds oxygen in high oxygen concentration areas like the lungs, and it distributes the oxygen to tissues that require oxygen to make energy. That's right, oxygen is required to make energy, ATP by the cells. And we need iron to get the oxygen to the cells to make the energy. If you can't get oxygen to the cells, you can't produce as much energy, that cell cannot function as well. What you might not know is that iron can be reduced and oxidised. And because of this activity, iron is actually very important, not only in bringing oxygen to the cells to make ATP, but also involved in the proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane of cells that generate a proton gradient that drives ATP synthesis. So the moral of the story is that iron is really, really important for making energy. And energy, especially in cells that use a lot of it, um, if you lack iron and you can't produce as much energy, that cell function is compromised. It's, iron is also involved because of its ability to accept and donate electrons. It's also involved in other processes, processes such as detoxifying certain harmful substances, um, and also an immune function. Iron, again, because of its ability to be um, oxidised or reduced, is also potentially um, risky. It can increase the amount of free radicals that we produce, and that can cause free radical damage or oxidative damage. Our immune system can use this to its advantage. It can make free radicals under controlled conditions and use these free radicals to kill pathogens. So again, if you have iron deficiency, your ability to kill pathogens can be compromised. So if we have suboptimal iron status, oxygen uh, distribution may be, may be compromised, energy production may be compromised, cells such as neurons, their activity may be reduced or may be compromised. So cognitive function, cognitive development can be depressed. Also, fatigue can occur, especially exercise performance. Not only does anemia cause a big decrease in exercise performance, but mild to moderate iron deficiency can as well. Not because we're reducing the number of red blood cells that we have, but because we reduce the amount of energy that the mitochondria can produce because we don't have as many enzymes in the mitochondria that generate ATP. Um, of course, uh, impaired immune function has been associated with iron deficiency because of the lack of ability now to produce free radicals and kill pathogens. 
and reduced cytochrome P450 activity, reduced ability to detoxify potentially harmful substances. So we've got iron in our body. Our body is actually very good at recycling that iron. When our red blood cells become old, become senescent, they are broken down by macrophage and that iron is recycled. And this process is actually quite efficient. About 10% of our body iron is lost and 90% is recovered. So we're actually very good at, at recycling our iron. This little bit of iron that is lost has to be replaced by dietary iron sources. And iron is incredibly abundant. It's the sixth most abundant um, metal on earth. So the question is, we don't actually need much iron from the diet, really, to replace what we've lost. And iron is very abundant. So why is iron absorption so prevalent? Why do we have such a problem? So why is iron deficiency so prevalent? Why do we have such a problem with iron deficiency? And the answer seems to be absorbing dietary iron from the food into the cell and into the blood is incredibly difficult. And it's affected by many different things, including iron type, the fat, uh, other factors in the diet, absorption enhancers, absorption inhibitors, your physiological state, your pathological state, um, gastric function, many different factors affect how we get iron from the digester into the blood. I want to talk briefly about different sources of dietary iron because their bioavailability differs. If you look at heme iron, and heme iron is probably the most famous type of dietary iron, heme iron, although it is the minority of iron within the diet, it has a very high level of bioavailability. Now, the latest figures that I've read, and um, it depends on who reports this, says that although dietary, dietary heme iron might only provide 10 to 20% of the iron within our diet, if you look at how much iron is actually taken up by the enterocyte, the cells that line the small intestine, that iron makes up almost 50% of your iron stores. So heme iron has a very high level of bioavailability. Heme iron is an iron molecule, or an iron, iron um, bound within a porphyrin ring, as shown here. So the iron itself is in the centre, and I've circled that in red, and the porphyrin ring is an organic structure that surrounds iron, and it acts like a bodyguard. It means that iron collators cannot collate this particular iron. It means that this iron stays soluble no matter if the conditions are oxidising or reducing. It means that iron cannot be bound by iron absorption inhibitors or enhancers. And it means that iron transport by the enterocyte well, it has its own specific mechanism. So when we consume heme iron, which is present in red meat, pork, fish, um, poultry, eggs, and eggs as well. Um, when you consume this heme iron, it goes into the stomach and it's bound within proteins like hemoglobin. Um, that iron is, well the heme iron is, is, comes off the, the hemoglobin, so it's released into the stomach. That heme iron is soluble both under acidic conditions like the stomach, but also in the small intestine, which is an oxidising environment. That heme iron is simply taken into the small intestine and heme iron absorption occurs within the small intestine and the heme iron is taken up into the enterocyte. Really nice and simple. Heme iron absorption is easy. But let's look at non-heme iron. Non-heme iron is the majority of iron within the diet. It's also present in meat. It's also present in fish, uh, seafood, poultry, pork, eggs. Um, Non-heme iron is present also in vegetables and grains and iron supplements. The problem is, non-heme iron doesn't have this porphyrin ring, it doesn't have this bodyguard. This means that because it can be reduced and oxidised, non-heme iron, uh, its bioavailability is affected depending on whether it's in reducing or oxidising environments. I've got in the figure down here at the bottom, reduction and oxidation of iron. Under acidic conditions like the stomach, iron is reduced to what we call the ferrous form. But under alkaline or neutral conditions, most of that ferrous iron is oxidised back to the ferric, ferric form. And this affects its bioavailability. So we consume, let's say, some spinach. 
contains non-heme iron. Some of that iron is released in the stomach. Now remember, the stomach is acidic, so iron is in a reduce, or the, the stomach is a, a re reducing condition, so iron forms the ferrous form. Ferrous iron is happy. Ferrous iron is soluble. Ferrous iron has the ability to interact with negatively charged ions or negatively charged molecules. Non, sorry, um, ferrous iron can be absorbed. Ferrous iron, iron has to be mostly in the, ferrous, uh, in the ferrous form to be transported. But the problem is, we don't absorb iron in the stomach. We absorb it in the small intestine. The small intestine is not acidic. The majority of the small intestine is alkali, or it's neutral, because the pancreas produces bicarbonate, and the acidic digester, as it moves from the stomach into the small intestine, is neutralized. The digester in the small intestine is neutral, and these are oxidizing conditions. So this lovely, soluble, happy ferrous iron becomes oxidized to unhappy, unsociable ferric iron. The majority of, of this iron is insoluble and it precipitates. It forms a big clump or a polymer and it's unavailable for absorption. What's more, ferric iron can't be transported really in large amounts in the small intestine, which means that before that ferric iron can be absorbed, it has to be reduced back to the ferrous form. So a little summary slide here. Ferrous iron formed under acidic conditions it's soluble and it can be, can be transported, but it's only really present in the stomach. Ferric iron, formed under neutral conditions like the small intestine, mostly insoluble and must be reduced back to the ferrous form before it can be transported. All clear so far? Yeah. Cool. So that's dietary iron. Now I want to look at the actual process of absorption. Iron for iron to be bioavailable, for iron to get from the digester into the blood, it has to go across the absorptive enterocyte. And transport from the, of the, from the digester into the cell cytosol has to go across the apical membrane. And that apical membrane, the transport process associated with this, can be influenced by physiological factors such as iron status, but also nutritional factors such as iron load or iron bioavailability. But that iron, if it goes into the cell, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get from the cell into the blood. Movement of iron from the cytosol to the blood is mostly controlled by physiological factors, and there are not many nutritional factors that can upregulate iron transport from the cytosol to the blood. The thing is, in many cases, the limiting factor is transport of iron from the digester into the cytosol. So if we can improve this part, then physiological factors take over and iron transport into the cell no longer becomes a limiting factor. So here's a nice picture of an enterocyte. On the left you've got food containing heme iron and non-heme iron. Now heme iron, remember it still has the porphyrin ring, is taken up by a specific heme uh, transporter into the cell. The iron is then removed from the porphyrin ring and the iron is either stored as ferritin, well it enters a labile iron pool, a collective um, cytosolic iron kind of pool. And from there it's either stored as ferritin, and ferritin is like a vault. It holds iron in a safe manner, or a safe form, and releases it as required. That labile iron pool can also be exported across the base lateral membrane, again by physiological mechanisms, to replete our iron stores within our body, or it can be used by the cell itself. Non-heme iron, must be first reduced to the ferrous form and can then be transported into the cytosol. And that also makes part or forms part of the labile iron pool. And again, that iron can then be stored, exported or used by the cell. Transport across this apical membrane can be influenced by the diet. But transport across the basal lateral membrane is only really controlled by physiological factors. So, we can increase apical iron transport by either increasing the iron load or increasing iron bioavailability. If we increase the amount of iron within the diet, then the theory is that more, although more ferric iron is going to precipitate, we may also have more ferric iron that's slightly soluble in the small intestine, which means we can reduce more of this back to the ferrous form and absorb it. 
But the problem is, if we've got lots of iron within the digester and lots of iron within the small intestine, we also have a high risk of gastrointestinal upset or gastrointestinal distress. So simply loading a diet full of iron may not be the best way to get to, to replete iron stores because it will lower compliance, amongst other problems. What we can do is consume more bioavailable iron, consume more heme iron, or consume factors that influence non-heme iron transport. And that way we can get more iron into the cell and stop that apical transport process being the limiting factor. Iron transport, so once the iron is within the cell, iron transport into the blood cannot be controlled by these dietary factors and is simply um, controlled by iron status or inflammatory status of the individual. So how can we increase iron absorption um, using dietary strategies? We can increase the iron load, but we've talked about that. This may be a problem. We can increase the bioavailability of iron by consuming more heme iron or consuming foods that enhance iron absorption or inhibit non-heme iron absorption. And I want to talk about these factors next. So we can increase or decrease the amount of non-heme iron that's absorbed. Remember that under acidic conditions, iron forms the soluble happy ferrous form. And under alkaline conditions, it forms the ferric insoluble unhappy form. If we can try and keep iron either in the ferrous form or hold it in a way to stop it from precipitating when it becomes oxidised, then in theory we can get more of that iron to the gut to either be taken up straight away if it's still in the ferrous form or to keep it in a soluble ferric form so it can be reduced and then transported. Vitamin C. I'm sure you guys have heard that when you drink vitamin C, uh, so drink orange juice with a meal, you get more iron from that meal. Is that clear? People have all heard that? <laughs> yeah? Cool. Basically, vitamin C can collate iron. It can bind to iron, which means that it forms a complex, and it means that iron absorption inhibitors, which I'll talk about next, cannot bind to the ferrous iron. Remember, iron is in the ferrous form. It's in the soluble form at this point. Vitamin C also has the ability to donate electrons, which means that not only is iron bound, which means that it cannot bind inhibitors, but when it goes into oxidising conditions like the small intestine, the iron is either held in a ferrous form or remains soluble, which means that transport by DMT1 in the small intestine is upregulated because there is more iron present to be transported. The problem with vitamin C is that it's not heat stable which means that if you've got some nice vitamin C rich tomatoes and you put it in a, a spinach based meal, that doesn't sound very nice, um, when you do that, if you cook the tomatoes first, you lose the enhancing effect. So if you're going to use vitamin C, you have to be very careful in how you deal with the vitamin C containing foods in order not to, to degrade it. Meat works similar to vitamin C. Now meat contains heme iron and non-heme iron, but it also contains factors that enhance non-heme iron absorption. When I say meat, I don't just mean red meat, I also mean pork, chicken, fish. Yeah? Now the mechanism seems to be similar. The problem is we don't actually know what the factor is. We call it the meat factor, and it seems to have a protein component, it seems to have a carbohydrate component, and it seems to have a lipid component. And it seems that one isn't as strong as the combination of all three. So it seems to be eating the entire meat rather than a small component of it. That seems to have a stronger enhancing effect. And it seems to also bind iron and protect it from collation by inhibitors. And it seems to also promote iron solubility and keep it in the ferrous form. The good thing about the meat factor is it is heat soluble. So you don't have to be as careful when preparing it. Iron inhibitors are the flip side, so either to improve the bioavailability of the diet, we can increase the amount of enhancers we consume, or we can reduce the number of inhibitors we consume. So inhibitors like polyphenols and phytates present, and I'm sorry about this, but red wine, coffee, dark chocolate, tea, all the good things, these, like vitamin C or like iron, are soluble in the stomach and they're negatively charged. 
iron is positively charged, they interact. The problem is that phytates and polyphenols have a very high affinity for iron, and they bind it very tightly. But also like iron, phytates and polyphenols are not soluble under oxidising conditions. So not only does iron precipitate by itself, but it's very tightly bound to phytates and polyphenols, and these also precipitate and further pull iron out of solution, further reduce the concentration of soluble iron present within the small intestine. Now these seem to compete with vitamin C and with meat proteins. So if you were to eat, let's say, iron and rich white bread that contains phytate, the amount of iron that's going to be absorbed from that bread is very low. If you consume meat or orange juice with that bread, then the enhancers are going to compete with the phytate or with the polyphenols, and the inhibiting effect is going to be less bad. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Now, remember that the interaction occurs when iron and when the polyphenols or phytates are present in the stomach at the same time. So you can still drink wine, eat chocolate, drink tea and coffee, but don't do it during main meals, either an hour or two before or an hour or two afterward, afterwards. Because as soon as that iron moves into the small intestine and it's in the ferric form, it's no longer available for chelation by these inhibitors or by these enhancers for that matter. Calcium is slightly different. Calcium also inhibits iron absorption, but this is a topical subject. Because when you give a human subject or an animal or a cell culture calcium and iron together as a single dose, the amount of iron that's absorbed is very low. But if you look at populations that consume lots of calcium, they are often not iron deficient. So we're not actually sure what the impact long term of consuming calcium is. But what it seems to do in the short term is decrease the amount of iron that the transporter, DMT1, can actually transport. And it also seems to pull DMT1 away from the apical membrane. It actually reduces the concentration of iron transporters present in the apical membrane. But again, we're not quite sure what the, repeated, the effect of repeated calcium exposure is long term. So the question is, if we use enhancers or we reduce the number of inhibitors we have in the meal to enhance iron absorption, is this dangerous for health? Can this lead to pathological iron loading? And their answer is, not usually, but we have to be careful here. All we're doing is enhancing the amount of iron that's absorbed across the apical membrane. We're only promoting iron transport from the digester into the cell. What we're not doing is promoting iron transport across the basolateral membrane. We're just turning apical iron transport, we're just making that not the limiting factor. Iron transport from the cytosol to the blood is controlled by physiological factors such as if your iron replete, if your iron stores are full, then you will simply not absorb the iron. The iron trapped within the cell, because these cells turn over every five to seven days, is simply lost when that cell sloths off the epithelial um, layer. Uh, but in some people that have got genetic mutations that affects or influences uh, basolateral iron transport, if they cannot control that transport properly, and you upregulate iron transport into the cell, then there is a risk of pathological iron loading. But this is only really in people that have um, genetic mutations that dysregulates baselateral iron transport. So I've got a few conclusions here. Dietary iron is required for correct cellular function. And iron losses must be replaced by dietary iron in order for those cells to work uh, properly. The amount of iron that's absorbed into the cell depends on the concentration of iron, the type of iron, and the presence of other dietary factors. Factors like vitamin C and meat enhance transport across the apical membrane. Factors like phytates and polyphenols inhibit transport across the apical membrane. But just because iron is now within the cell does not necessarily mean it's going to go across the basolateral membrane and replete iron stores. That's it from me. A quick thank you to Beef and Lamb for letting me speak here today. And thank you to Massey University for letting me take the day off work to come and speak to you guys. <laughs>